we have more author interviews for you here from Seton Hill University. Uh, and joining me is Diana Botsford. Did I get that right? You did. I, Thank you for having uh, me. Yeah, thanks for being with us. We're going to talk a little bit about the projects that you have in the works. Uh, are you uh, you promoting anything right now? Um, at the moment, I'm promoting a lot of different things. I work in a lot of different mediums. So uh, I have two Stargate novels out that are doing very well. Um, I have one, that, in fact, that's got a second printing. I have a science fiction web series called Epilogue that I created and produced this last year, and it just won an Emmy and two Telly Awards, so we're promoting that as well, and that was done with uh, Missouri State University. And uh, that, and I'm getting ready to settle back in and hunker down and write some new stuff. Sounds, sounds like you have a lot of go going on. I was just talking about being tired beforehand, and, and I <laughs> don't do quite as much as you do, so. Uh. Well, ask her where she went to do research oh. for her mm -hmm. second book. Well, my second book, and in the, if you know the Stargate series, a lot of the mythology takes place in Antarctica. Okay. And I feel that there's only so many times you can say the word cold. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I really wanted to figure out where in the world would it really, would the ancient outpost really exist. So um, the Air Force is very supportive of the Stargate franchise, so I contacted the U.S. Air Force, sat down with them, and uh, they helped, along with the university that I'm a professor at, they helped to fund my getting on a research mm -hmm. vessel. And I went down to Antarctica for a few weeks, a couple of years ago, and spent some time with scientists, asking a lot of questions and figuring out, both from a geological and a biological perspective, how someone could survive. Because one of the main characters has to trek across the continent on their own in the early 50s with no food wow. on their pack. But at the turn of the last century, you had all those expeditions making the trek, and they would store food underneath rock cairns okay. as they were going along the way. So our alien friend in the Stargate book, my, my story, finds those and huh. eats that food to survive, along with, sorry, but he ate some penguins and some seals, too. Oh, we were just talking about Deanna is the penguin mother. She makes all those little Well, penguins. here's the deal. That's how the real explorers survived, uh, because mm -hmm. they found, Amundsen found out from the Eskimos that the, the seal brains actually have something in it that prevent uh, scurvy. And the reason why Scott didn't survive is because Scott refused to eat seals. And the reason why Shackleton and their misadventure did survive is because he was willing to eat seal. Huh. Interesting. So I have to go back to the fact that you said uh, you said you can only say cold so many times. Yeah. So how do you describe that uh, when you when you tell your friends about that exploration that you made that that research? How do you describe the uh, the surroundings? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you you can describe it. Obviously, in the midst of telling the story, this character. Uh, both of the main characters in the story are going through midlife crises, and they've been separated and isolated from their groups, their teams. So that sense of isolation, that sense of brutal honesty and how it bites at you, it bites at your skin, and it just hardens your, uh, just your, the taste, the smell, even breathing in can you know, make the nostrils, the hairs on the nostrils get stiff. So putting it in context of the emotional arc that they were going through was very helpful. And the reason why it's called the drift is that there is this continental drift device that's suddenly accelerating continental drift and it's ripping the different continents apart on the planet. And it sort of also fits with the theme of the feeling of being isolated from their teams, being pulled away from not just their teams, but from their selves which is part of midlife crisis. You're like, I forgot who I am. Who am I? So there's kind of a physical manifestation exactly. as that's pulling away. Exactly. exactly. Heidi, you were mentioning that she's uh, done work in the motion the picture. film industry, yes. Industry? I mean, everywhere, yeah. yeah. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that work that you've done? That's actually, that was my first intent. I, mean, I saw um, Empire Strikes Back. I was just talking about this with my critique partners. <clears throat> I saw Empire Strikes <clears throat> Back when I was a kid. Well. A team, and I was like, that's it, that's what I want to do. I want to tell stories, I want to be the next George Lucas. Mm -hmm. And so I went to film school for undergraduate screenwriting and producing, and I went to LA and uh, I wrote for Star Trek Next Generation, did a little for Deep Space Nine, I did a lot of development work for family programming. I did uh, Heathcliff, and in I produced Inspector Gadget, 
Wheeled Warriors, Spiral Zone, MASH, you know, a bunch of things. And then I got bored with animation and went into live action. And I worked on Tales from the Dark Side. And I did uh, Terminator 2, I did visual effects on. And Dustled On was my swan song. That, I was the second unit director and visual effects supervisor on that. And I wrote and developed on the side. And then I just got to a point where I hit the glass ceiling, to be perfectly frank, and I hit it very hard as a woman. It's still, it's getting better, thanks for Catherine Bigelow, and television is particularly getting better about it, but we still have another generation to go, and I wanted to own my stories and make them happen, so, you know, I spent a little time working for Microsoft and then came here to Seton Hill, and it changed my life. I know. I told you, mm -hmm. everybody always says that. We honestly mean it whenever we say that. Just, now, how different was it going then to doing a web series? Well, um, you know, it's a different experience to experience a web series. There's more of a sense of immediacy. Mm -hmm. There's more of a sense of it's right here, whether it's on your iPad, iPhone, or your computer screen, and it's being aware as a writer of that. But we also, we really use the model of writing a television series. I had a writer's room, and we plotted out the whole arc and then assign the different scripts, and then it was the spinning, and not someone would bring an idea, you throw the ball around, one person's idea becomes a better idea, becomes a better idea, becomes a better idea. It's collaboration. Right. And collaboration is a wonderful thing that you don't get necessarily from most novel writing. And the control so, has to be a lot better, too, than when you were actually in That's what being the showrunner's about, and I'm a control freak, so yeah, that worked very well. <laughs> I don't know many writers who aren't. <laughs> <laughs> this, this Just a little bit. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, when you're mapping out your entire world, you know, in a literary sense, you, you have all the control, so. But there is something about the idea that a good idea can come from anywhere and collaboration. There is a, a fellow graduate here I'm collaborating with a project on. It's just, it's a joy. And even critiquing is, in a sense, collaboration, mm -hmm. isn't it? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. So what, what's next for you? What's where next? Where are you going from here? Um, I'm actually revisiting my original thesis project, and uh, this fellow alum and I are doing a transmedia project that involves prose, graphic novel, and augmented reality. Very, very interesting. Now, if someone wants to catch up with you, find out what you're doing, where in the process you are, do you have a, a website, I, uh, Twitter? I, I have you? lots of things, but if they go to dianabotsford.com, there are links to them all there. I'm also the co-host of the Gate World podcast. And I contribute to Gate World quite a bit, which is a Stargate, very popular Stargate thing, so they can join us there, too. Okay. okay. Well, hey, it's been great having you Thank on you. Uh, with us today, and I've enjoyed the conversation. Got to get a little bit of insight into who you are and the projects you're working with. Uh, if you'll stick around, we'll be back in just a few moments with some more interviews from Seton Hill University. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yeah, Heidi, hey, thanks. thanks.